All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with actor John Kapalos about his days on the stage, his nights filming Forever Night, getting in the zone as a performer, and more. As always, thank you all for listening out there. And if you'd like to help the show grow and you're listening on your podcasting platform of choice, please leave us a review. If you happen to be watching the video on YouTube, please like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff I have to say because it does help. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. John, take us back in time. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? Could you repeat the... uh... I can, I can. Okay, so we got book reader, fort builder, troublemaker all of the above probably more of of all of them probably a troublemaker i wasn't um and i'm not destructive by nature although i think i probably have been in interpersonal relationships without knowing it early on in life but you know (laughs) i'll I'll just cop to being a a a person in that regard um no i think more or less i was um probably because i was the youngest of of three, I was probably more into getting people's attention. So I used my wiles, either my uh, ability to get attention or humor or any sort of thing that got that. Not cherry bombs, though. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> no, nothing nothing to hurt people or animals. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Maybe, maybe what... anything to hurt my dad's feelings, you know. <laughs> my but... So whereabouts did you grow up? Oh, I grew up. I'm sorry, your accent's very... I'm in South Carolina. I get it all the time. I, mean, I grew up well in London, Ontario, where we don't have as, as charming an accent as you. <laughs> London, Ontario, Canada, um, which is uh, two hours from Detroit, two mm. hours from Toronto, and sort of the boot of Southern Ontario, Canada. When it comes to your parents, were either of them artistically inclined or involved in the business at all? You think that's where your roots came from performance wise? You know, I think um, my mother and father were both people who appreciated the arts. I don't think that they would be. Um, my mother, you know, played violin in high school and and loved music. And I think my father loved, as I said, the arts and literature. My dad read a lot. My dad would be uh, of your. Uh, he was be the, he would be the reader. Mm. And both my siblings were. Um, my older siblings were, and are quite intellectual. Um, I think that for the most part, um, growing up as I did, you know, um, I probably gravitated towards performance just to get attention, as I said. Yeah. So so speaking of music, um, what sort of records were spinning around the house when you were growing up? Well, you know, um, I listened to a lot of people my age and they talk about their parents and what they listen to. And and, uh, my folks... We had a record player and we listened to it a lot. So my parents listened to Greek music because my, both my parents, my father was born in Greece and my mother was born of Greek parents. So they had that sort of part in their in their past. And that would be Greek folk music, a lot of them. Um, I mean, Greek folk music, which is strangely like other types of folk music, stringed instrument, a lot of singing about broken lives and lost and love and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, 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 and sort of also an interesting mix of um, what I would call um, show tunes and popular music mm. and, and things that I think gravitated towards uh, folk music. And, you know, my, my brother and sister, as they were older, we listened to a lot of, you know, Joan Baez and, and Bob Dylan and a lot of folk music in the early 60s. And then, um, you know, on that uh, fateful February morning in 19, or February morning, it was a morning the day after at school when the Beatles played at, uh, on Ed Sullivan. I mean, that changed everything. Mm. Like in any kid that was like, you know, I was in grade two, as we said, in Canada or second grade. And like, you know, it was amazing how transformative that was. I get, yeah, I get that a lot, especially from people from that era. Well, and you also have to understand, I mean, it's kind of like if you place yourself in a, I mean, I know that oh, I'm just picking up stuff here. <laughs> on the floor, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
if if you put yourself in that time frame when Kennedy was assassinated, it it uh, irked and jerked the world, and uh, people were I think collectively depressed. And then when the Beatles showed up, it was like, wow, this is cool, and yeah. it sort of made everybody feel better. And I know it's it sounds like a cliche, and it's sort of like people look back on it, but it's true. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> in the February of nineteen sixty four. That dark winter, there wasn't much to look forward to. And uh, but I also think for me, um just the fact that you know the radio and and you know we're lucky, I was lucky to grow up in a time when you know music was always swirling around wherever you were. And did you uh pick up an instrument yourself ever? I took eight years of piano, mm. uh, it was sort of foisted on me, and then I picked up the guitar, the the uh, the ukulele and then the guitar. So mm. I, I taught myself how to play the guitar. And now I'm <laughs> trying to figure it out <laughs> for real as a as a too late adult. But, I mean, Never. you know, if you play if anybody plays an instrument, uh, it's always a lifelong fascination, right? Right, right. Did you ever uh, have any inkling to join any bands early on? Honestly, I had I had a really good friend of mine, Paul who was, uh, he's, um, sadly he's died, um, but he was a great guitar player, as well as being a really sweet man. And he was so good, man. He was so good. I realized, gosh, you know, if that's what it takes, I don't have that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, he was, you know, out of the box, he was good. Now, in retrospect, I probably could have gotten better <laughs> and probably still can, you know, practice and there are two types of people, people that are really great out of the box. I mean, I've seen this with actors too. You know, I don't think I was, I think I was probably a little bit better out of the box as an actor, but still, I think there's a bit of a curse when you're really, really good at something right away. Yeah. Because sometimes you don't work at it as hard or you don't appreciate it. Um, But that's another story. <laughs> so in terms of the, the, the music thing, I really felt like, um, I had a stronger choice in being in, in, in the theater and, and being an actor. Plus, I think I liked it more. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I had more of a feel for it. Um, I don't know why, because, I mean, I came out of nowhere. And with that, you know, the talented analogy that you were uh, talking about, uh, one I like to use is uh, just like uh, any famous sports figure, you know, like Michael Jordan is one of the greatest basketball players of all time, but... On, on the same vein, he's also one of the worst general managers of all time because he can't understand why these players were not able to do what he can do, you know? Well, you know, it, 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 I mean, that's, uh, I like, I would, you know, I, I've directed and I would like to direct more. Uh, I hope I'm a good director, but it's interesting how people's talents, you know, are specific to, you know, their particular you know, specialty or superpower. Right, know. right, right. And, um, you know, for example, um, you know, certain musicians are great musicians, but they're not, they're not good in a group. Exactly. Or certain guys are better in a group or people are better in a group than they are individually. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, people have strengths. Um, and uh, I think as an actor, what's important to realize is you have to identify, I think the actors that I think that succeed, and this is a big, I think the actors that succeed dot, 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 but are ones that can identify their weakest points and try to improve them, period. I think most artists, you yeah. know, if you're not good at something, it's good to know that you're not good at it. But what I don't like is when somebody says to me, oh, I'm not good at that. I say, well, wait a minute, you can get better at that if you know you're not good at that. And there are lots of things that I think people put in front of themselves who are saying, well, I'm not good at, therefore, I'm never going to be good at that. And again, that's another subject. <laughs> a little self-awareness goes a long way. <laughs> well, I mean, in the acting world, it certainly does. And in mm. the performance world, you have to have a certain amount of self-awareness, a certain amount, you know, and also you have to be somewhat fearless and, but, but. Self-awareness in that, you know, I you'll meet certain performers and say, I should be able to play, you know, this sort of character. And you go, well, wait a minute, that's not something realistically you should do. 
Right. And vice versa, people might say, well, you know, have you ever considered doing this? Well, that's outside of my range. Well, maybe it isn't, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, Herbie Hancock has written a wonderful book called Possibilities. It's a great book. And uh, just the title alone. But, you know, understanding the possibilities. I know this is unprompted because I'm yammering, yammering a lot. But John Candy was a big mentor in my early life when I started acting at Second City in Toronto. And, and it was all about this is possible. This is a choice you can make. This is a choice you can make. And, you know, and as an actor or as a musician, like, wait a minute, I can play this chord or I can play it this way or I can think about something this way or I don't have to play it that way, you know? I don't have to be that way. That was the exciting thing for me, finding Second City. Right. It wasn't necessarily traditional theater, per se. Right. I could go up on stage and, you know, improvise and perhaps be funny and then, you know, perhaps make some money. <laughs> Since you just mentioned his name, were you you and John were at Second City to, together at the same time? Not really. Um, I was uh, John Candy was way ahead of me, a bit older in age and, and much more experienced and, and together. Um, when I started in the workshops in 1978, he was a well-established actor and he was in the main company at Second City. So he was sort of a mentor to a group of us, Understood. Um, a, a group of us actors and um and I've said this time and time again, and uh, it, it's, it's very sad that he's not around, but he, to know this, but he was a wonderful teacher, really, really mm. good teacher. And he well, knew so. how to impart that sort of stuff. And um, the more you see the types of um, Philistines, the people that pass themselves off for teachers in the acting world, be it here in New York or in L.A., I mean, here in, in, in L.A. or New York or Chicago, um, there are people that, you know, say they're acting coaches, but uh, they're, you know, they're collecting money and um, cashing in on people's hopes and dreams. Right. So I feel about that. <laughs> so, John, before we go too far from your childhood, uh, when you think back to uh, formative childhood, <laughs> childhood. <laughs> your formative films and TV shows you grew up on, what, what comes to mind initially? Well, you know, where I grew up, there were only um, two TV stations as a kid. There was the Canadian Broadcasting and then Canadian Television, and two two networks. They came in with bunny ears. And London, Ontario was the first place in North America because of the wealthy families in my neighborhood who cabled, brought cable TV in. So mm -hmm. friends of mine would watch U.S. cable TV. But for the most part, my early influences would be, I would say the biggest influence <laughs> would be uh, uh, Warner Brothers cartoons, the evening news, um, the afternoon news, which I would watch with my, my mother, and movies, old movies. Um, I would get into the habit of coming home for lunch every day growing up and watch about 20 minutes of the beginning of the afternoon movie and go home back to school thinking about what was the rest of the movie. No DVR. <laughs> no. And then I'd come home at night and say, hey, Ma, tell me about the rest of the movie. And she'd be, you know, ironing and watching the movie or whatever she'd be doing. <laughs> and we would talk about it. And sometimes what I fantasized would be the end of the movie would be actually better than what the actual movie was. Right. <laughs> Do you remember the first film that you saw in theaters? Oh, gosh, in theaters? I saw a movie Father Goose with Cary Grant, 1962. I think... Um, I mean, Mary Poppins, 63, when I started, I mean, I used to go to the movies a lot on my own on Sunday, so Longest Day. I could probably, any movie from 1961, uh, war movies were big, like The Longest Day, I love that movie. And um, I love cowboy movies. Mm -hmm. um, we had theaters downtown, so you could, you know, as kids would do those days, you'd go and you'd watch the movie twice. Yeah. You know, and uh, maybe you'd sneak into another theater if it was, um, you know. Security so was lax. That, that period, you know, and also Mr. Trudell, who ran the Capitol Theater, lived across the street from us. Oh. <laughs> Although he was a pretty um, strict guy. <laughs> um, first, I mean, I saw a lot of movies growing up. So, I mean, and on TV, I remember watching, um, I really remember watching uh, Some Like It Hot. 
I loved that movie, the Jack Lemmon, Tony Curtis movie. Um, and then, and, you know, again, not to get to, um, well, you're asking me about my life in London, Ontario, Canada, you'd get on Canadian TV, you'd get a unholy mix of American movies and then English movies mm -hmm. and American TV and English TV. So I'd sometimes get these English TV shows and my mother being a Bostonian, she uh, prejudiced me against my English TV. <laughs> she never really came on. She was... um, but, you know, uh, probably I, I saw too many movies to give you one specific one. But I remember yeah. vividly, and this is again going back to the Beatles, that transformative February was Mary Poppins and the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Wow. And, and all the girls loved Mary Poppins and all, well, and now the guys did too for the most part. <laughs> but, but it was, you know, it skewed more girly. Were uh, drive ins as big a deal in Canada back in those days as it was in the US? You know, I was too young. Um, drive ins had sort of faded by the time in the late 60s when I got there. But for my brother and sister's generations, they were around. And, you know, my brother, my, 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 my cousin, Nick, who's 10 years older than me, he was what we would call a greaser, you know, an Elvis type. Yeah. He had the hair and the comb. And he was like Paul Amat in American Graffiti. You know, I don't know. You, yeah, you yeah, know. I'm with you. <laughs> he was like, you know, and I, I, I adored him. Although I have to say, when I sort of got into music, <laughs> I have to say, this is going to, I'm not a big Elvis guy. I'm a Beatles guy. So, you know, um, nothing wrong with Elvis. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I picked the four lads from Liverpool. And then, you know, I, I also grew up next to Motown. So, I mean, CKLW, which is a Canadian radio station in Windsor, any kid from my hometown, anybody will tell you my generation, that was the big eight of Windsor, the Motor City. And they just blasted Motown. Mm -hmm. So the Supremes, the Temps, the, you know, the, the Four Tops, uh, Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell, you know. All that stuff, you know, Jackson Five, blah blah blah, all the effing time. Wow. And um, I mean, my sister to this day, I mean, whenever I hear a Motown tune, that is my sister's jam, and um, you know, like that. Yeah, the good stuff. <laughs> but the good stuff, and you know, um, it was just always. It was you know the word is ubiquitous. I mean, it was just always in the air. I mean. It was, so speaking of Motown, I was just, you know, Barry Gordy's still alive. That's that's wild to think about. I had no idea he was still alive until I was just looking into it recently. recently. Well, I mean, they, <laughs> I know a little about the guy, but I'm sure that he's lived well and that he's looked <laughs> after himself because he didn't seem to be one of those people that was uh, burning the candle too much. Right, right. And then, John, this is something I like to ask everyone just because you know, you never know. Uh, what scared you as a kid? I had a reoccurring dream. Factories, monsters, and I really hated Sylvester the Cat. Really? Freaking scared the, the gond out of me. Even to this day, I see him. It does me a little thing. Um, Yeah, certain cartoon characters. Um, And also my brother and sister, man, they would, you know, I was afraid of the dark. <laughs> we, My family's Greek Orthodox, and we had this glow-in-the-dark cross mm -hmm. corner. And uh, I saw a movie talking about movies when I was a boy. Uh, it was an Italian film or something where this kid disappears and turns up to be a, he becomes an icon on the wall. <laughs> so every night I'd fall asleep and that this like glowing cross would be at the end of my bed and I'd just be like this. <laughs> so traumatized by, and my brother and sister wouldn't help. Like they'd say, you know, good night, good night. By the way, don't look under the bed. Boom, it's time to go. <laughs> So you grew up in the 60s. I'm surprised you weren't a Twilight Zone kid like most folks at that time. Well, here you say you're talking about TV. The problem was that because of the two channel thing and lack of access to American programming. Oh, yeah. I grew up watching Carson and all that stuff. The kids in my neighborhood who had the cable, they would tell me, oh, there's this guy named Jack Parr and there's this, you know, Joey Bishop show. And, there's... and then the monkeys and that sort of stuff would be would seep in, you know. And uh, Beverly Hillbillies, all the shows that would get picked up by Canadian TV, and then, and then we finally forced our parents getting getting cable. But this is when we were into high school, and uh, <laughs> that's another story. 
<laughs> and then my dad got a show on the local cable CV station. What? <laughs> a Greek uh, themed show for uh, for uh, the church. <laughs> wow, that's cool. <laughs> so, uh, do you have a maybe an aha or a eureka moment you can point to where you decided to give the whole acting thing a try, and you thought, you know, that's for me? Well, you know, I mean, probably. Um, when I was in high school, I uh, the way I went in Canada, where I went to school, is you have uh, kindergarten through uh, grade eight, and then nine through thirteen, so five years of high school. And the fifth year, you get advanced placement into second year university. They've since dropped it, so it's now up to twelve. But so five years of high school was a bit, you know, the fifth year you're you're a bit mature, and you start chomping at the bit. But it's it's not a bad year. That said, I went into um, ninth grade and I pulled curtains for the school show, which was the uh, the boyfriend. In other words, I was a curtain puller and I watched him and I was backstage. And the next year I auditioned for the show and I got the lead in Guys and Dolls. And I was Nathan Detroit. And I, I, that's when I truly got bitten. Mm. <laughs> I got the lead in the school show. I got to get out of class. I got to get a lot of attention. I was pretty good in the show. I got to sing. I got to get a lot of attention. Did I say that? <laughs> uh, I got to um, get the attention of females, which was kind of one of the points. And um, I actually was pretty good at it. And yeah. it was it was something like I went, whoa, this is, I like this. Mm-hmm. I actually have tapes of the show, like an audio tape. And I mean, it, it was a big moment in my life. And I was in 10th grade. And then I wanted to do serious plays in high school and nobody would. And then uh, I started getting involved with the university in my hometown. And then I went away to university and fancied myself a journalist for a year at, at uh, Carleton University in Ottawa. And then I went to the theater department and film department. Mm. And... Um, I left without graduating, much to my parents' eternal chagrin. And then I, um, for a year, I spent sort of wandering. I worked on an oil rig. I was in Western Canada. I worked in a record store. I starved. And then um, sort of had uh, a made up with my parents. I was sort of not in a good place after having quit university. And then I came back and miraculously the the stage of my life I got involved with Second City mm. and that was the whole whirlwind and are that happened around 22 are you so, familiar with uh, Armin Shimmerman the actor Armin Shimmerman I should be <laughs> who is he uh, just off the top of my head I don't know if you watch Star Trek The Next Generation he was Quark oh uh, yeah I know the name but I don't know the person no no I don't he said something I really uh, like, and I've kind of incorporated it into interviews now. Uh, there's been a couple of times where he said he's been on stage where it's almost like athletes, how they equate it to being in the zone. And he doesn't remember the actual performance. It's, he just remembers that he did this play on stage at this time, and that's it. Doesn't remember you know, the I mean, scene changes or anything. You're flashing forward to, I mean... Yeah, I mean, that's a whole process thing. I mean, I did a play several years ago at the, about seven, eight years ago with Matthew Ark and at the, called The Prince of Atlantis at the Sagerstrom Arts Center here. And there were nights, and I, I played this fish manga from Boston who lied about his fish, uh, labeling his fish, and somebody died in his restaurant and he was in jail for it, manslaughter, in the play. <laughs> um, and there were nights when, uh, you know, I would come off stage and go, wow. What happened? You know, yeah. There was a sense of awareness. But when you, but there were nights when um, I thought I was pretty fucking good up there. And all of a sudden I was thinking the wrong thing. And I was, I took myself out of it. There was one particular night when I thought to myself in the middle of the monologue, Hey, this is going really well. <laughs> and then the next thing you knew, I didn't know what I was going to say next because mm -hmm. I wasn't in the zone. Right. So to be in the zone also knows you have to know when not to be in the zone. It's like a skier. I mean, you, when you know how you're slaloming well, but when you know you're not, that's when you wipe out. 
the thing about being a pro is wiping out without breaking your neck and also being able to sometimes being able to do it in front of an audience without them being able to tell the difference, right. which, is, which is a real trick. And that's um, what, you know, doing 8,000 shows at Second City taught me. Um, have, you ever, have you ever been heckled on stage? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I remember when I had my first drink. It's the first thing you say to somebody that yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Is he with you? <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there are lots of things that I am not a stand-up though, right? And I'm not a stand-up comedian. I don't have the skill set to to really batter down some, you know, corrosive individual in the audience. What I know how to do on stage is act, and also if if something goes awry. In other words, if somebody doesn't pick up a cue, a line goes to this and that, to keep it going, keep it going. And that's how, that happens a lot, unfortunately, more than one would like. But, you know, that's also part of the process. You know, you can't, it's like, you know, a doctor in the middle of the operation, if something goes wrong, you go, well, this is bad. What am I going to do now? So, you know, <laughs> you know, you know uh, take a moment, think, you know. <laughs> You know, you don't want anybody just to jerk themselves out all of a sudden, so to speak, and like, you know, pull themselves out of the moment and go, you know. Right, right. I think you want in any professional situation, you know, <laughs> a race car driver, your your best friend driving you to, you know, the airport. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this. This is something I like to ask all actors that I speak with because, you know, to us laymans like myself, uh, I feel like the term method acting is kind of thrown around and it's become muddled. So, oh. I've speak, spoken to enough actors at this point to realize that everyone has their own kind of method, an individual method. What's your method? It's an interesting thing, method acting, because unfortunately, I think, you know, um, it's one of those things that's misconstrued. I'm not going to explain it right now, but my my method is to, and I know this sounds great, but it's to really learn the lines. Learn the lines, learn the lines. Um, because if the lines are second nature, and they're bobbling off your tongue, particularly if you're in a situation where it's vernacular, it's not necessarily um, set dialogue vis-a-vis -vis Shakespeare. If it is, then you really have to learn your lines and memorize that stuff. You can't deviate from it. And I respect that stuff. You know, a lot of people to say because you come out of a second city or an improvisational background, you don't have respect for, you know, the script. That's that's bull honky. Once you got this stuff in your head, then you're not groping for stuff to say. If it's in the vernacular world, you know, there's a great acting exercise. Like if I'm saying my computer is green, uh, say it a different way. Um, my uh, laptop is a different color. My, you know, and so what you do is you try to know the stuff in such a way that if you get stuck, you know the intention behind it. Right. So you can still... Um, in a situation of dialogue where they say, well, you use glass instead of a, a coffee cup. Well, it doesn't matter in the context. I was still in the moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you interpolate words and things, but in the larger thing, you're in the thing. And, and the other thing is to understand, um, and these are pretty basic, but what your want is in a particular situation. For example, right now, I want to give you a good interview and I want to tell you good things. And you would like to have a good interview and you would like to know more about me. So those are our simple wants. The right. other one could be, um, I want to make sure that my dog gets, who's here, gets dinner on time tonight and that my wife and I, you know, have, make our rendezvous. You know, we all have these different wants. I want to make sure, you know, and, and they're all on the, all these different levels, right? Right. And so in order to sort of shelve that into an actor saying, well, what do I, what does the actor want here? What is, you know, what is the script telling me he wants here and there? Um, and sometimes, ironically, you know, it's not important for an actor to know everything that's going on in the script. Yeah, I'm informed about this, but it doesn't really sometimes inform me when another actor is doing it in another scene. Uh, unless it informs what I'm supposed to know, you know, so there are things you have to make sure that you cut in and out. Um, that's why certain directors will only give the scenes that the actor is in or that the actor is sort of involved with because the other stuff is extraneous. 
And mm -hmm. in life, do you know what your brother is saying right now in another room to, to you know, and do you need to know that? You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. In the yeah. broad scheme of things, do we know what everybody's saying in other parts of the world or in our lives? Right. Unless it informs us, unless my brother's talking to my sister about something that they want to tell me about. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, I'm following you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you have to, as an actor, cut out what's extraneous. Right. Do I really need to know this? Is that going to mess me up? OK, what am I what are my wants? And then. Um, to believe, to believe and how that it, how that manifests itself. And, you know, and that's where either the method comes into play. You know, the very famous story about, you know, people that, you know, with Laurence Olivier, who was all about his technique and and. Um, Dustin Hoffman, who immersed himself in the method, and they were about to shoot the scene in Marathon Man. Do you know this story? I don't. And uh, Dustin Hoffman, you know this Marathon Man, and and Dust and 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 uh, uh, Lord Olivier is about to put the you know with this trying to get the thing from his teeth. Is it safe? He's trying to drill Dustin Hoffman's teeth and get these information anyway. It's a very and, and Dustin often stayed up for days and days and days so he could be ragtag and you know really feel horrible. And Lawrence Olivier, just before they yelled action, he turned to him and he says, Why don't you try acting, young man? And and coming from Olivier, it was perfectly evident that he could become this thing through his own technique. But it became a, a story that everybody talks about to this day, where two sort of massive different styles sort of came into play if you watch the scene they're both phenomenal mm -hmm. right so where they came from and what the how they arrived at it um is somewhat immaterial because they arrived at it yeah it doesn't really matter in the end if they both get there if you yeah you know it, it i mean it matters it matters to them yeah right yeah but, but at the end result is you know um, they got there. Um, and, and, you know, it's a little bit inside baseball. It's like, you know, when I'm, you talk to guitar players about what sort of size string they use, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, <laughs> get into that. <laughs> and it, I mean, and, and there are reasons, you know, you use that sort of string and it gives a certain sound, but you know, at least they got there. And, yeah. um, I think that the method is, is more, um, misunderstood now, unfortunately. Yeah. Than anything. And it's one of those things that's become so diffuse by so many different actors that, you know, um, you just have to look at the individual actor and see how they're, how they're, uh, they're wired. Right. And uh, so, John, how do we go from, you know, you're on the stage with Second City. How do you get that first professional uh, screen role? Well, I mean, you know, for me, it was just finding a way in. And, uh, you know, was that my laugh and my smarminess or something, you know, everybody, sometimes reviewers or people would say, oh, he's a greasy or greasy characters or this, you know, but, you know, like 16 Candles and those guys, you know, just to try to get in the door and play these guys. And, and so I said to my agent at the time, a wonderful Harice Davidson, who's still a dear friend, I just want to be in the movies. So you know, get me an audition, even if the part is not within, you know, my range. And and when I was sent in for Rudy Rizchek and 16 Candles, it had been sort of, they were writing it for maybe a different type of uh, family. And uh, John sort of reoriented it for my guy um, a little bit. I think there was supposed to be a little bit more uh, um, haughty toddy. Mm. The results, but they turned out to be a little bit more um, not hotty toddy. <laughs> I was going to ask if you he obviously liked what you did because you were in pretty much every John Hughes movie in the 80s or most of them, a good bit of them. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I John and I got along. I liked him. He liked me. I didn't know him long enough. And sadly, um, you know, um, Time goes by, you don't see people, then all of a sudden they're not here for whatever right. reason. Um, he, 
And I clicked and yeah, there was, you know, but he also had other actors, John Candy, Steve Martin. There were people that he really liked using mm -hmm. and, uh, over and over again. A really wonderful actor from Second City, Larry Hankin. I mean, he used these oh, guys yeah. to great effect. And so John really had a keen eye and he loved his Second City actor. So I can't say it was merely me, but I'll take I'll take it. I was cut out of Ferris Bueller, which was a drag. So has there ever been a, a piece of direction that you've received from a director that made a role or seen click for you in your head? I think when I did uh, Internal Affairs with Michael Figgis, I did this scene with Richard Gere where he's basically feeling my wife up under the table and, and more. And then he shakes my hand with what he's just done. It's pretty funky. But I don't know specifically what Figgis said to me, but it was one of the times, I don't know, do you know of the movie? Do you know the movie? I'm not familiar with it, no. Oh, it's it's not a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the first film. Do you know the film? Do you know of it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I just haven't seen it. It's it's a I think, well, that's one of the best movies I think I've been in. But um, it's also an incredibly, although it's in color, it's a rich film noir. You know, sort of a dark. And Richard Gere, I think, is very brave in the movie. And then Michael Figgis just sort of said, you know. Um, and again, I don't remember specifically what he said, but, you know, the words just floated off the page. And it's one of the few times in the movies when, not that I didn't feel like I was acting, but I felt like I was in a different world. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and like that's, you know, it sounds like airy-fairy and a little bit transcendental, but it was uh, weird. And the scene, the scene to me has this ethereal quality when I see it. It's pretty intense and sexual and depending on how you look on it, at it sort of um, air, got an air of um, danger. Mm. Gotcha. <laughs> well, uh, John, my first personal experience with your work was Forever Night. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Wait, you yeah. Do you remember that audition? A tip that was that a typical audition? Is anything stand out about uh, about it to you in retrospect? Well, I mean, it's I don't know whether you know this, but I did shot the whole pilot episode with Rick Springfield, and then we did it again in Canada. So it was like repeating a year of school. Um, and I was sort of um, physically different than the second one. I'd put on some weight when I did the ended up doing the series. But that said, um. I had a deal over at New World Television, and I had a show of my own, and the show didn't go. It was called Monterey Jack. I was about an unemployed, I mean, a man who was a head of a music booking agency, and his wife had gone on and become Madonna, and he was raising their child, single parent, and he, uh, and there was another show at the time called Blossom. Hmm that got picked up instead of our show, which is again with uh, about Ted Wass, a single parent, and Lyam Bialy was the kid. So the similar plot shows, his took off, ours didn't. So then in lieu of that, um, Jim Perry was putting together this show over at, uh, <coughs> at uh, New World, which um, eventually became Columbia Pictures Television. And um, this is probably too technical. And... Um, they brought me on. I did the first um, Nick Knight, it was called, with Farhad Mann, directed it with Rick Springfield. And then they decided to do it in Can Canada and asked me to do it. And that's when I went up and, and did this series again. And John Kassar was the DP, the camera guy on the first episode. He ended up producing 24 with, uh, what's his name, Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was, a, it was a great learning experience. I'll tell you what Forever and I did for me as an actor. I mean, this is probably boring shit to you, but. No, I, this is why we're here. <laughs> is, that, is that I was, I loved the experience. And, um, you know, when I first did Tootsie, it was the very first film I did. I was so stiff in front of the camera. I thought millions of people are going to watch this. I was so unnatural. And getting in, front, in Second City, getting in front of all those audiences, performing in the theater loosens you up. But doing 48 episodes of Forever Night really made me comfortable in front of the camera. Mm. 
and it gave me an ease and a comfort, not a disrespect and not a not a, ca a cavalier attitude about the camera, because I still respect it and and uh, you know adhere to its many many strictures, because the camera is something you have to really understand in order to do well in front of it, in my opinion. But it was a freaking exercise in, you know, a lot of stuff. And, you know, you think, well, you know, entering the camera from this angle, this, and you're shooting stuff at three, four in the morning. You know, we had the shooting schedule in Forever Night was tough because we'd start three in the afternoon and shoot till three in the morning, but eventually would slide four in the afternoon, five. And we, you know, and there were a lot of divorces and uh, shooting at night is really tough. I spoke with Nigel Bennett uh, a long, uh, about a year and a half ago, and he absolutely hated that filming schedule. <laughs> That's one of the things he talked harped about the most. And and uh, I'm, I couldn't agree with him more. <laughs> um, I, I really like Nigel. I think he's a wonderful performer. And, uh, you know, I think he's great, great, great. And I could not agree with him more. It was, <laughs> it was debilitating. And I think in a lot of ways, it didn't have to be that way, but you know, I mean, it didn't have to. Uh, there are there are, there are other ways I could have done it, but you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> so a lot of the, a lot of the success of that show, I think, was definitely the buddy cop aspect. You know, between you and Mister Davies, did you guys notice that you got were hitting it off quick with it, or did you guys put time into it, or was it just a natural chemistry type of deal? You know, um. I don't think we put any time into it. I mean, you know, like worked it out. Geraint is a charming guy. He's a really charming man. He's very attractive. Women love, love, love him. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's he's one of these guys that just drips sort of charm and oozes it. He's Scottish. I mean, I'm sorry, he's Welsh. Jeez, I'm sorry, Geraint. <laughs> well, uh, he's, you know, his father... I don't know, I, I'm, perhaps he's passed away, but is a minister. It was a lovely, lovely, Garant's just got a lot of great qualities about him. And I like him. Mm -hmm. And I liked him instantly. I also like to tease this shite out of him. <laughs> and, and also we come from different acting schools. He's very sort of, you know, he's very sort of um, like those, you know, flashbacks in Forever Night. I mean, I couldn't, I mean, I call it, I could have acted them, but that's not my type of thing. You know, I'm more of a contemporary guy. Mm -hmm. And, I, like, and I, I, I immediately got what Skanky was about. Skanky was about the audience. He was about like, he was saying stuff that the audience wanted to say, like, why don't you ever drink anything? <laughs> and, and what is wrong with you? And like, you know, that sort of stuff, like anybody would like ask of like, what the, why don't I ever see you eat anything? Yeah. Why do you only work night shift? <laughs> and why do you look like, what is the what is your problem i mean that was my the human element and and whether the writers or anybody else got that i got that mm -hmm. and i'm i'm earth he's you know eternity i'm total like donuts and and reality and and pimples and poop and and, and, <laughs> and the way it is to live on, on on the earth and he's sort of this ethereal being and in terms of like acting styles, he's sort of this Shakespearean Stratford guy. And I'm more of a, you know, pragmatic, I would say, um, in that quality. Uh, you know, and so I wasn't afraid to improvise, change stuff. And Gareth sort of got a little bit pressured about that. Sometimes we'd conflict about, like, are you going to say, really going to say that? And I go, yeah. Um, and also... Um, there was no way I was not going to make this relationship work. You know, even if the guy didn't like me and was stiff, I was still going to, you know, but, but Gare was just, you know, good crack as they say in Ireland. <laughs> you know, to this day, uh, unless you're, you got to find a DVD on uh, eBay. I, I can't find forever night season three anywhere. What, what happened there between season two and season three? I'll be blunt. Um, they jump from CBS to USA. Jim Perriott says to me in a lunch meeting, they want to go younger. They want to bring in a woman. 
They want to move you to the, the captain's office and reduce your hours and your pay. So you're, you're basically firing me. You know, I don't want to be Cagney, Lacey, get in here. You know, that's right. not, uh, you know, I'm not going to be, and I'm not going to be stone tree or whatever they, the guy was, the character, you know, you're not going to move me to the office and then give me one day a week and reduce my pay and say, Oh, this is fun. I said, basically you're firing me. And I, and then I said to him, uh, and I didn't say this with any rancor or, but I said, I think the show is going to suffer. And I think the fans aren't going to like this. It's not going to work. It did. And it suffered. You're kind of pulling out, you're kind of pulling an element out of the show. And if you're going to add this female element, so he's going to have sort of a love interest in the present day. Well, I mean, as a writer, which I am in addition, uh, I did write and direct an episode of the code and, and uh, partners of the month and all that stuff. Um, and I said to them, uh, he has all these love interests in the backstory. To complicate it in the present with a, a woman is the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. Give him a young male partner. You know, if you're going to give him a partner, give him a guy that's in his 20s. Right. That's going to challenge him with the women that way. <laughs> I mean, that would be my... But no, they wanted to bring in uh, the young lady, which they did. And, um, you know, the and result, you know. Um, the rest is history, unfortunately. Yeah, and you know, the problem in this world is, I mean, in this, and many showrunners will tell you this, is because you want to staff these shows with writers, you bring in people that don't know the arc of the stories. So they would change things on Garrett or this and that. And they go, well, wait a minute, he doesn't drink wine. He, or he doesn't do this. Or he doesn't do that. You know? Right. And, so, and you'll find this in a lot of shows. The inconsistencies that arise when somebody in season four didn't know what somebody in season two did. And it's like, and, and the people that know this are the fans. <laughs> and, um, you know, Fans hate to hear this, but they're sometimes the last people anybody thinks of. Right. And you know better than I do how ravenous uh, Forever Night fans can be because as when I teased that you were coming on here, I got hit with a good bit of messages in my Instagram account for questions. And the one that comes up the most, I have to ask or I'll be crucified, is this. Do you, have you had any contact or do you know how Deborah Duchesne is doing? Because she's completely disappeared off the face of the earth since that show, essentially. No, I don't. I am concerned, but I have no idea where she is. And um, I'll probably um, I'll probably ask around them because enough people have asked. I'll try to find something out. Okay. That a lot of people would appreciate that, myself included. They just not just to make sure she's you know doing well and all that good stuff. I think that that is a, a fair, fair, fair question, and. A lot of people, myself included, are care about her and, and are, are curious and hope, you know, are curious about her well-being and hope that she's well. So, um, let me um, let me see what I can find out. I can't make any promises. Understood. Well, uh, to move on from Forever Night, uh, John, my this is a minor role of yours that my wife freaked out about because her favorite movie <laughs> is Legally Blonde. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. working on. <laughs> yeah, so, no reason to laugh. Don't laugh. <laughs> so when you, when she, good taste. yeah, when she found out that you were the uh, the husband that gets the slap for the dog, she squealed. <laughs> Dewey Newcomb is my character in that, mm -hmm. and uh, I unfortunately did the movie uncredited because I had a unscrupulous manager at the time who um, neglected to do his job. That said, um, I love doing the movie. Uh, I think Jennifer Coolidge is swell, swell, swell. Reese was uh, cute to work with. I didn't really get to interact with her as much as Jennifer. And, um, I mean, Jennifer's done incredibly well. Yeah, yeah, really, she has. And she's really, really funny and <laughs> idiosyncratic. <laughs> Um, she really, I think, uh, cool. Uh, that film was an interesting experience because 
I had to burst out of this door and go, what do you want to um, Jennifer Coolidge? And the young director, a fellow named Robert Luketic, had just directed a beautiful, small Australian film and then was given this huge gargantuan movie to direct. And there are literally about 10 producers in front of the monitor on the set. And this guy's kind of trying to bounce up to see the monitor, the director. <laughs> and I, I, not that he was out of his depth, because he wasn't, but I think he was a little bit nervous and nerve wracked. Mm -hmm. And as I said, all these producers were Mark Platt or whoever they were crowded around the, um, the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> they made me open that door like, you know, what do you want? Over 30, 35 times. And and honestly, they didn't know what they wanted. They go, uh, they go, okay, well, open it this time like you're angry. What do you want? Next time, okay, um, no, 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 it's too angry. Uh, a little bit more questioning. What do you want? No, 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 no. Uh, could you do it angry and questioning? What do you want? It's like, no, no, too questioning, maybe a little less angry. <laughs> and on and on. Meanwhile, we also had a, a a dog in that thing. But, you know, the saving grace was working with Jennifer because she's so effing funny that it was kind of like the time I worked with Michael Richards on Seinfeld. I really had to control from not breaking up on screen. Difficult to do. Mm -hmm. when, when that little mouse, the rat in the skull is going, mm, you're going to laugh, you're going to laugh. So, <laughs> that was tough. So, uh, what would you say is the best acting advice you've received and who gave it to you? Oh God, that's such a good question. Hmm. I think, <sighs> I don't know whether this is good advice, but I think, um, No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually breaking the rule. I think actually the best thing to do sometimes is to, if you're doing a lot of dialogue, um, that it's not a bad thing to talk fast on screen. And an actor once told me, the, the, the expression is bullshit, but stars talk fast. Well, you know, I mean, Cary Grant and Bring Up Baby, or I mean, and, uh, um, the front page or, you know, these classic films where people are just rattling it off. But there is something to be said with the rapidity in dialogue and to no pace. <laughs> and another actor once said to me, we were talking about actors and the difference between this actor and that actor is taste, right? Now, taste is a very subjective thing, and sometimes you don't think of taste when it comes to actors. But what, why does this person make this choice and this person make that choice? And why is this choice more interesting or tastier or more provocative than that choice? And then you come into this whole notion of taste. And taste is, again, a very subjective thing, and it's a very delicate thing. But what makes this guitarist sound better than that one. Right. Why is this interpretation of a Dylan song more interesting than this one? You know what I mean? Um, understanding in, in subtext and all those sort of elements. So when you get the words out of the way, and even the stuff like your want in the scene and your sort of your basic stuff as an actor, then you can get down to the real work. And then when you see an actor like Mark Rylance, for example, today, who I think is the bomb, he's incredible. Uh, you know who he is? Not off the top of my head, no. Oh, well, um, he's a phenomenal actor. Check him out. <laughs> I will. English actor. But when you see actors like that, Daniel Day-Lewis, et cetera, that are, um, um, even Brad Pitt, you know, he gets better. Gets better. Right? Right. And and another thing, Martin Brest and De Niro taught me this a bit when I spent a day on, I didn't do any parts in the movie, but I spent a whole day with De Niro on Midnight Run. And I realized a lot of acting is thinking. 
you're thinking about what the person might do next. Now, so to show somebody thinking is a very, but let's say one of my favorite movies is um, Bullet. Mm -hmm. You know, even watching Steve McQueen, Great Escape, Bullet, just these moments like he's a very silent actor, but he's not silent because the wheels are always turning. He's thinking, you know, and on to the next thing. And that has to do with writing and, but good acting is thinking it's not always talking right and when you talk you know make your point but um and remember your lines <laughs> well you know there's the 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 um the, the spencer tracing you know learn your lines hit your mark and don't bump into the furniture <laughs> and strangely enough that's fucking true <laughs> <laughs> keep it simple <laughs> well i mean you know and Never be afraid, and I'll say this to actors and people, never be afraid to ask what you think is the dumbest or simplest question. Because sometimes it turns out to be the most profound. Right. Like, most which simple. way does this door open is a simple question. But sometimes if you don't know which way the door opens, you don't know if it's going to hit you in the face or cut your finger in two, which it did, or other things. So you think, well, that's a simple question. But, you know... Um, when you're running through at full speed, people coming at you with guns, well, boom, we want to know, does that door, when it opens, slap back at you? Can we try this for full speed rehearsal? We don't have time. Ah, uh, if we don't have time, we get injured. So these are, you know. Right. These are things you learn on a film set so you don't get hurt, you know. Right. And well, um, you don't hurt others. I know that that sounds, that you know. Hey. You know, the you know, like the whole thing that unfortunately this happened to Mr. Baldwin is like, oh, you know, like unspeakably uh, whatever. And you, one should never encounter things like that. Right, right. Well, just to wind down with these last two here, John, not going to keep you all afternoon. Uh, have I bored you? I mean, are you no, have to no, 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 not at all. So um, I'm not funny at all today. I mean, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I mean, that's the thing I get really. So this is, I want to show you something. This is the stage I was at at Second City in Chicago. Wow. Did you build that? No, um, I had a friend of ours build it for us. Uh, and it was a cast gift that the, the stage manager, Craig Taylor, and I gave to our cast low these many years ago. We gave it to them in 1985. March 13th, 1985. Did you... Uh... I don't know. Was did you work at Rob Paulson with Second City at all? I don't. I think he was at Second City. Uh, he was, I believe, he was after me. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm an old cart. <laughs> I was going to say codger and fart, and then I said cart. So I'm an old. Cart. Hey, it adds up. <laughs> uh, this is a, another question I like to ask everyone, John. Uh, have you ever had an experience that you would consider supernatural or paranormal? If you don't like those words, an experience you can't explain. Yeah. My mother um, was lying in the uh, assisted living facility. It was at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. And she woke up out of a coma and said, call Caitlin. Caitlin's in trouble. Caitlin was my 11-year-old niece. Well, she insisted. And she was in a coma. She'd been in a, she hadn't been talking much. She woke up out of this, she had a brain tumor. So she insisted, We. I got on the, the uh, phone and I called my brother-in-law and he said, well, Caitlin's at school. They had a snow day. Um, this was supposed to be a home day, but it was a snow day. So they sent them to school today to make a makeup day at school. I got off the phone and I said to my mother, Caitlin's okay, mom. No, call Caitlin. 20 minutes later, we get a call back from my brother-in-law. Caitlin has been admitted to the emergency room because she had a, she, she passed out at school. Approximately the same moment, my mother woke up and said, call Caitlin. Wow. So you tell me. That, that definitely falls in the event and you my, can't explain. My, Caitlin is my mother's, Caitlin Ann, my mother's name was Anna. 
So Caitlin was named after my mother and they had a connection and my mom died shortly thereafter. And Caitlin survived um, a massively, she had a, a huge sort of a chemical deficiency in her body that had to be uh, fixed with um, drugs that she takes to this day. Wow. So it was, and she was just starting, she was 12 or 13. So she was just starting her female stuff. So this is what happened that Monday morning at 1030, 10 o'clock. That definitely counts. So, you know, um, I'm a skeptic. That blew me out of the water. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, just to put a bow on this here, uh, what's on the horizon for you? You got anything in the pipeline that you can share without getting in trouble? Well, to be honest with you, I'm getting my knee replaced next Monday. Yeah, you did mention that. I hope that goes smoothly for you. I hope so. And, oh, and I think this is... that the doctor? No. <laughs> this is my wife. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing. Um, and, uh, and then beyond that, I, I hope to, uh, be doing a, my own show that I've been writing and developing and, um, the jury's still out on what we're going to call it, but it's sort of a film noir detective thing. Okay. That's right up your alley. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, really, it is. And I, and, 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 you know, I really look forward to doing it and this is my office, my, my think tank in here. So this is where all the, uh nightmares happen well, that's awesome john uh, i look forward to that and i want to just thank you for giving me some of your time here well thank you for letting me yammer away <laughs> hey i enjoyed it we'll have to do it again when you get that other show off the ground let me know when this is uh, showing I'll, do you show it or do you uh I, i'll i'll do everything uh but i'll edit it and make it pretty you know my uh, motto is fix it in post <laughs> <laughs> god where have i heard that before <laughs> I want that t-shirt. Yeah, 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 exactly. Good merch. Thank you for your time and trouble.